Good afternoon and welcome to MTV's News Update Weekend Review. As we look at some of our top stories we covered for the week ending Friday, July 13. I'm Sandy Ramutar. Good afternoon. We begin tonight's broadcast by telling you that a 15-year-old boy was on Monday stabbed to death at a wedding house on the east bank of Demerara. The dead teen was identified as Ricardo Singh of Lot 63 Block 1 and 2 Diamond Housing Scheme, East Bank, Demerara. A police report said that just after midnight, the boy was discovered with a stab wound to the abdomen at the Sue's Dyke Linen Highway wedding house. He was pronounced dead on arrival at the Diamond Diagnostic Center. Two males have been arrested and investigations continue. Godfrey Brooms now reports that Guyanese are told to brace themselves for continued drug shortages at medical facilities across the country as the government has no proper system in place to deal with the issue. This confession came from Public Health Minister Valda Lawrence who assured that her government will strive to ensure as much as possible drugs are available to patients. There have been numerous reports of unavailability of basic medical supplies at various hospitals countrywide. Acknowledging this phenomenon, Public Health Minister Valda Lawrence highlighted that drug shortages will continue. We have a few drugs that are out and this will always be because we don't have a system that gives you accurate figures. Minister Lawrence claimed that upon investigation, she was told that while some drugs are to be purchased, there is enough to cater for Guyana's populace. I have been assured that the drugs within the system, that they can meet the needs of the people of Guyana. That's what's more important to us. The public health minister mentioned that her ministry will strive to ensure all medical centers and hospitals are stocked with the necessary drugs and equipment to cater to every Guyanese, regardless of location. To ensure that whether you're in, in Bamadai or you're in Baramito or where you are, that those health facilities are stocked with the necessary drugs and medical supplies. Minister Lawrence also noted that no public health center should ask any individual to purchase drugs elsewhere. Rather, the minister affirmed that that center should liaise with the hospital in the region to obtain pharmaceuticals once a patient is in need. Godfrey Brooms, MTV News Update. Armed with video evidence, relatives of a man who died because of severe burns at an interior location on Monday said that they were not buying his employer's claim that it was an accident and are calling for answers. Details in this report. 37-year-old Shahin Shah Ali on Sunday, July 1, received third-degree burns while pumping fuel from one oil tanker to another at Frenchman Hill Trail just off Mabura. The man was rushed to a city hospital but died five days later. Relatives spoke with his employer and were told that he received his injuries because of an accidental explosion. However, the man's pregnant wife, Shalana MacDonald, said based on the video and pictorial evidence she received, his employer's story is not adding up. <laughs> He didn't come out to the family to explain what had transpired there when he was there at the scene. He didn't come out to nobody. He tried contacting him. He's not answering his phone. Until today, like now, he knows that my husband died and he is sure on to now. News Update contacted the man's employer, Marlon Johnson, who said he was present at the time of the incident. But when told about the evidence which relatives say are not adding up, Johnson said he could not explain the incident properly since it happened so fast. He has promised to cooperate with police to ensure there is a thorough investigation. Meanwhile, a source close to the investigation refused to give details, but said the matter is initially being treated as an accident. The source refused to say if that has changed, but noted that a file is being prepared to be sent to the Director of Public Prosecution for advice. Kippany Jordan reporting for MTV's News Update. A 19-year-old woman was under observation at a city hospital after she reportedly excreted 44 poking pellets following her arrest at the Chedi Jagan International Airport by the Customs Anti-Narcotics Unit, Kanu. 
Online news site Demora Waves reported that a woman is among four persons arrested two Fridays ago by Khan Ranks. She was an outgoing passenger on flight BW526 designed for JFK International Airport. Kanu said that the interdiction led to an operation at a location on the east coast of Demora Friday evening where 279 suspected cooking field pellets were seized. Three persons were arrested and two suspects remain at large. With just two press conferences in three years, President David Grange on Monday said he was too busy to engage the media at this time. Here's that story. So I'm asking the media to be tolerant. My heart is in the right place, but um, right now I have had a, a really difficult uh, period of public engagements and overseas travel. President David Granger on the sidelines of the opening of the Caribbean Information and Communications Technology ICT Conference and Roadshow at the Arthur Chang Conference Center Monday morning. Asked when exactly he will formally engage the press, the president did not give a definite timeline. Um, it could be a very challenging period and as soon as I get the opportunity I will engage with the press. But I have been traveling quite a lot and I have um, to deal with domestic issues, the sugar industry, I have to deal with the petroleum industry, I have to deal with crime and security. Since assuming office in 2015, President Granger only engaged the media twice, the last being December of 2017. Instead of constant news conferences, the president had opted for a pre-recorded program called The Public Interest, which allowed selected media houses and the Department of Public Information to participate. But even that program has been discontinued. Reporting for MTV News Update, Lashona Gomes, Cornelius. On Tuesday, Chelsea Griffith reported that police were probing the murder of a popular pundit and his son, whose partly decomposed bodies were found in a Camerville, Georgetown home, earlier in the day. Dead are Dianorain Lilia, 61, a well-known pundit of the Parfait Harmony Mandir, and his son, Gopal Lilia, 28, both of Lot 25, Craig Street, Camberville, Georgetown. The partly decomposed bodies were found by investigators around 10 hours today. The tenant on the lower flat of the building reportedly told investigators that she last saw the two men around 6 hours on Saturday. However, about 21 hours, the woman said she was using the Wi-Fi, which suddenly went off. While she heard footsteps coming from the top flat but did not suspect anything was amiss. This morning the woman reportedly became suspicious after the two men were nowhere to be seen and there was a foul smell emanating from the upper flat. The woman reported the matter to the Kitty police station and when ranks visited the scene they found the back door to the upper flat where the men lived open. Gopal was found lying face down on the floor in a pool of blood with a red jersey wrapped around his head with stab wounds to the back, abdomen and chest. Dionorine was found lying on his back in the living room with a cloth over his face and stab wounds to the abdomen, back and hip. The source said CCTV recordings obtained from a nearby building revealed that an unidentified male was seen jumping the western fence and entered the home through the northern front door. He later left with two bulky bags and a bucket. According to Dionorine's younger brother Benji, he did not see nor hear from his brother for a few days, so he ventured to his home to investigate. So when he passed, we really see the police already here already. The tenant downstairs, we had a make report the station. And then they smell something funny upstairs, and then they see me. It was there that he was told of his brother's demise. No one has been arrested thus far as police continue their investigations. Chelsea Griffith reporting for MTV News Update. Also on Tuesday, Godfrey Brooms reported that the Burbies Bridge Company called for a significant increase in tolls as the company claims it is on the verge of bankruptcy. The company said that it has already incurred a loss of $2.8 billion since the bridge began operations. The Burbies Bridge Company Incorporated claims that it is not generating enough revenue to offset its expenses. Chairman of the company, Dr. Sarendra Prasad, claims that the company has never been able to pay dividends to its shareholders since its formation. Dr. Prasad blames this on the government's failure to respond to the company's requests to adjust the tolls annually. The cumulative result of the government's failure to implement the contractual agreement 
has led to the bridge company now accumulating a loss of approximately $2.8 billion and the company now faces bankruptcy. The company had made three previous applications on March 25, August 6, 2015 and January 2016. As such, the company is making another proposal to the government for toll increases. The toll adjustment is an essential requirement to ensure that the bridge company can continue to execute its mandate, including meeting its obligations to its financiers. The bridge company is calling for significant increases in the tolls since it was not approved since 2014. The proposed cost for a minibus is $8,040, an increase of $5,840. The highest proposed increase is for boats from $110,000 to $401,040. In 2006, under President Barajagdio, the government entered into a public-private partnership to construct a bridge across the Burbese River. The Burbese River Bridge was completed in December 2008, allowing for the flow of vehicular traffic to and from Burbese. The investors established the Burbese Bridge Company, which is to own and operate the bridge for 21 years. After that period, the bridge would be handed over to the state at no cost. Since the bridge was built, the toll has not been increased. The National Insurance Scheme is the largest shareholder in the company. The Burbese Bridge Company has assured the populace that the bridge is safe. Godfrey Brooms, MTV News Update. Police and soldiers in Guyana are fighting 21st century criminals and drug traffickers with 19th century equipment and institutions. This was a view of United States Ambassador in Georgetown, Perry Holloway. The Shana Gomes Kerninas filed that report on Tuesday. Despite some minor improvements in its efforts, Guyana remains a major drug transshipment point for Latin America and the Caribbean drug lords. At least, this is the view of United States Ambassador Perry Holloway, recognizing the country's vast forested and mountainous regions and porous borders as some of the challenges for local law enforcement. Holloway said Guyana remains a top choice for drug smugglers with the increase in production and shipment of cocaine in South America. He bemoaned the facilities that are currently provided to local law enforcement to fight the drug trade and other crimes. You, you can't have police or GDF or other officials, you know, going after 21st century criminals with 19th century equipment and institutions. It just can't be done. The diplomat said while his country stands ready to continue to lend financial and other support to policy makers here, the government needs to do much more. So more can be done in the ports. I know our Coast Guard comes down in TSA and does a port assessment every year. Guyana actually, as far as the Caribbean region, scores pretty high on there. So there are a lot more measures to take, but I think the structure of the ports and how many, that's a national decision a lot of times based on the economy and history and very little one can do to change it. Holloway was at the time addressing the Guyana Manufacturing and Services Association's annual business luncheon at the Pegasus Hotel today. Reporting for MTV News Update, Lashona Gomes, Cornelius. Tempers flared Wednesday between the government and opposition during an anti-corruption session facilitated by the Special Organized Crime Unit in the Parliament Chambers. Here's that report. Resigning should be resolved, it should be redrawn. That statement, because it's intended to lynch Dr. Sivington, is an intention. It is an intention right, to, to, discredit, to discredit an advisor right, to right. a, a, an important agency. All right. And you didn't come can I, here. Can I? We all came here to learn, not to prosecute. And what is taking place is a prosecution. Of the of the advisor, All right. and this is that is a clear case yeah. where I believe I, 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 I that the member should withdraw. <coughs> he should withdraw his assertion. That was a scene between Prime Minister Moses Nagamutu and PPP Member of Parliament Duan Ejil.
The Prime Minister was at the time requesting the opposition to act modestly when dispensing questions to British crime expert Sam Sitlinton. Sitlinton at that time was facilitating an anti-bribery, corruption, fraud and money laundering seminar for members of Parliament. During the session, the opposition took the opportunity to raise concerns on allegations of corrupt activities under the current government. And then we're looking at the Durban Park as another perceived corrupt uh, project. And efforts by the opposition to have this uh, uh, investigated in court were shot down by the DPP and I'm sure under the advice of the government. But these are glaring cases, sir, and there's no indication that your office or you have been able to advise the government that these, these projects is corrupt. But Sidlinton made it clear that sole investigation on suspicious corrupt activities are beyond his terms of reference. He said investigations are facilitated through referrals from the Commissioner of Police or referral agencies bounded by the Constitution. Um, none of those cases you mentioned have been referred to SOCU, nor have they been referred to the Police Commissioner. Now, as an investigator, I welcome any case that comes to SOCU that I can look at and, and help them investigate. Uh, so uh, they, those cases have to be referred to the police commissioner who will refer them to SOCU. The fiasco escalated when the Prime Minister opted to describe the other side of the house as that of a lynch gang. Nagamoto's choice of words came after an MP on the other side of the house demand Sidlington's resignation. He was immediately requested to withdraw his statement by the opposition, but was interrupted by Minister of Public Security, Kemra Dramjadan, who brought order to the House. We all want to learn, but to turn this into a lynch gang is not helpful. It is not helpful. The intention is clear, patently clear, by calling for Dr. Sittleton to resign because because I want the I want that statement to be withdrawn. Soko was established in 2013 as a law enforcement agency to investigate exclusively allegations and reports of money laundering and terrorism. Soku has been at the centre of much controversy after it laid a series of charges against former ministers and top operatives of the previous PPP administration. The PPP had been describing the actions of Soku as political witch hunting under directives from the government, an allegation the administration has denied. Soku had also refused to investigate a number of allegations brought against the government by the opposition. Sandy Ramutar for MTV's News Update. Government rejected outright the Barbies Bridge Company proposal for massive increases in the toll to cross that bridge. Godfrey Brooms have filed that story on Wednesday. The Ministry of Public Infrastructure has daunted the hopes of the Barbies Bridge Company Limited of toll increases. Yesterday, Chairman of the company, Dr. Sarendra Prasad, outlined BBCI's opposition of drastic increases of the toll. In the company's proposition, it was noted that three previous requests for toll increases had been denied, one by the PPP government and two by the APNU AFC government. The company wanted the toll for minibuses to jump from $2,200 to $8,040. The rationale behind it was that the company has never been able to pay dividends to its shareholders and it faces bankruptcy. However, the hope of achieving this was quickly shattered by the government. In a statement to the press by the Public Infrastructure Ministry, it outrightly denied any increases to the toll. The statement said that the toll must remain reasonable. The government said any request for increases must not solely be on the basis of recuperating operational costs and profits on dividends. When questioned about the affordability of the proposed increases at a press conference on July 10, this is what the chairman of the company had to say. Our contract does not give us the luxury to pick and choose. Our contract asks us to follow the tolling policy. 
it is up to the other party to determine how they would like to flex. But we have to follow the contract. Godfrey Brooms, MTV News Update. Also on Wednesday, the parliamentary opposition rejected a proposed increase in the Burbies River Bridge toll and instead put forward two options to the government to deal with the issue. During a news conference today, opposition leader Barrett Jagdeo said he will not be supporting the calls by the Burbies Bridge Company for increased tolls. Jagdeo instead put forward what he believes can save the company from bankruptcy. 24, 20. 14 and 2015 should have gone up. I was told, I asked the guys because I have, I didn't get to read the entire model. It would have gone up by 6%, just over 6% in 2014 and about 17% in 2015. And then after that, because they would have repaid the bond, they would be in a steep decline from the current prices from 2018 onwards to 2020 something when the bridge would be handed over to the government. Jagdeo reminded the government about the financial model used for the bridge under the previous administration. With that model, tolls were predicted to significantly decline as increased revenues prior 2018 would have been used to secure bond payments. One, buy out the other shareholders, buy out people so that it more of the bridge becomes publicly owned, and se or secondly, subsidize the, the increase that should take place in the, in, in the toll. As such, he's requesting the government to release the financial model left behind by the People's Progressive Party. Sandy Ramutar, for MTV's News Update. The final rites took place on Wednesday for a well-known Camerville pandit and his son who were found dead in their home. Our special reporter Zahir Khan reported that new information service of what appears to be a well-planned hit on the men. As police continue to investigate the brutal murders of a Camerville pandit and his son, relatives and friends bid them farewell today. The road leading to Sandy's funeral home was lined both sides with vehicles and a packed space filled with many known faces from communities and companies. The bodies lay in closed caskets with many outpouring tributes. We did not cry for Lilia because Lilia has lived and he played his innings very, very well, very meaningful. As I said, if we can emulate the kind of enthusiasm this young man had, then we will know that we will be prepared for the next life. Because I know what a good man he is. What a good man he is. What a good father he is. What a good Hindu he is. It's something that I'm sure we can all better our lives if we can keep some things in the president himself. Today we therefore pray for him and pray for his very beloved son who was so dear to him that his own life. This morning, as when it said, I can see a lot of pieces, and it is a testimony of how many lives they were that my dad brought him, when there are many of you knew him, how many lives he would have touched in one way or another. And when we speak of touching, he had a passion for communication. Whether he found time to come to see you personally, he stopped you on the road, or with the advent of WhatsApp, he wants up to everything with some word of wisdom to tell you you should put your right foot down in the morning and not your left. Or you should look in the mirror and see your face first. <coughs> he definitely was someone in the game contact. Another twist to the circumstances leading to the brutal murders has surfaced. There is an ongoing court battle between the overseas son of the victim and another man from Kitty. According to information, just over a year ago, a lawsuit for $50 million was filed against the man for non-payment and bad faith. The matter was called up several times and the son and the defendant showed up to give evidence in the case. The lawsuit was filed after the defendant failed to pay for large quantities of jira and masala shipped to the United States. The matter is at its closing stages and a decision is expected soon. Relatives are not ruling out the possibility that these murders could be a hit. 
One source close to the family said that it seems to be a well-orchestrated hit, made to look like a robbery gone wrong. The source explained that someone knew to hire men who were well acquainted with the pandit and worked for him. He added that the brutality and multiple stabbings are proof that the men went there to kill. It is not clear whether the police are looking into this latest development, up to the time of this report. Also on Wednesday, we reported that scores of logging workers were on the breadline as worsening conditions of interior roads were forcing many logging companies to either close or downsize their operations. Here is that report. The Ghana Manufacturing and Services Association today expressed concern over the worsening conditions of interior roads which is causing suffering and losses to timber producers. The GMSA in a statement said small, medium and large-scale loggers are experiencing one of the worst periods with significant losses because of deplorable interior roads. Across the country, the hinterland road conditions have significantly worsened due to an extent extended rainy season and poor maintenance. It is said that at least 100,000 square meters of logs cannot be delivered, leaving many value-added producers without raw materials and missing export deadlines. This crisis, the GMSA said, has led to some companies completely stop production, while others suffer as much as 50% revenue loss. Additionally, skilled workers are being sent home or the workforce being downsized. Many small loggers are forced to continue working because of financial commitments, and such operators are putting their lives in danger and causing damage to their limited equipment. The maintenance of the interior forest roads is largely left up to large forest concessionaires, specifically holders of TSAs. It cost an average of U.S. $14,000 to construct one kilometer or forest road and an average of U.S. $5,000 on maintenance without any government support. As such, the GMSA wants government to take urgent action to repair and maintain interior roads and for there to be a comprehensive program of ongoing maintenance. Reporting for MTV News Update, Lashona Gomes, Cornelius. Friday, Zahir Abbas reported that investigators may have been closer to a breakthrough in the gruesome murder of a popular pandit and his son as an alleged mastermind was arrested. An interesting turn of events as police continue their intense investigation into Tuesday's gruesome discovery of two bodies in Crack Street, Campville. The father and son were brutally killed sometime around Saturday last. Within 24 hours, police took two suspects into custody. One caught with the victim's cell phone and another referred to as a person of interest. However, the person of interest in custody over 72 hours now is in fact the alleged mastermind. Information is that within hours of the first arrest, the alleged mastermind behind the double murder was taken into custody. Sources close to the investigation confirmed that the police have enough evidence taken from the scene and from CCTV footage to help them solve this heinous crime that still triggers widespread concerns and condemnation. Up to today, the police maintained a presence at the crime scene. The actions of that dreadful evening are said to be premeditated judging from the continued stabbing of both victims to make sure they don't survive. As was reported in an earlier story, a judgment is expected soon on the $50 million lawsuit filed by the Pandit's other son who lives overseas against his business partner and friend who now remains in custody. The legal troubles involve a container of Jira, which the defendant refused to pay for, claiming it went bad. But in court documents, testimony, and legal agreements, it was shown that the defendant wanted to renege on the arrangement and refused to pay a substantial sum close to $10 million owed to the victims. Police may seek an extension to the 72 hours as the probe intensifies. Is the businessman the mastermind who allegedly hired known thugs to brutally murder the father and son? Or are there more surprises left in this ongoing investigation? I'm Zahir Abbas, 
with this latest update. Also on Friday, we reported that a policeman was nabbed with over 46 pounds of compressed marijuana during a sting operation. The police constable is attached to the tactical service unit of the Ghana Police Force. Police spokesman Superintendent Jai Ram Ramlakan has said intensified collaborative intelligence work by ranks of the Police Narcotics Branch and the C Division resulted in the arrest. He said the constable, who was driving a Georgetown bound vehicle, was intercepted on the Cove John Public Road, East Coast of the Marar, about nine hours Friday. A search of the vehicle revealed several taped parcels of compressed cannabis to weighing more than 21 grams. Also on Friday, the Opposition People's Progressive Party called for the Ethnic Relations Commission to conduct a comparative fact-based study on the welfare of afro guyanese under the past and present governments. Here is that story. Opposition leader Bar Jagdio has requested the Ethnic Relations Commission to conduct a comparative fact-based study on the welfare of afro guyanese under the past and present governments. During the periods 1964 to 1992 under the People's National Congress Administration, 1992 to 2015 under the People's Progressive Party Civic Administration, and 2015 to present under the APNU AFC coalition government. Jagdeo, accompanied by Opposition Chief Whip Gail Tishera and Member of Parliament Juan Egil, welcomed a courtesy call by the Ethnic Relations Commission yesterday. Well, we have advocated to the Commission that meritocracy is our standard. We are not asking for the hiring of Indians or blacks or any other race. We are saying let the process be fair, let it be transparent, and let it be on the basis of meritocracy. And that was made clear to the commission by the leader of the opposition when we met with them. The meeting saw open discussions on race relations and matters impacting ethnic insecurities in the country. Jagli opined that the study will find that afro guyanese did better under the successive People's Progressive Party government. He also asks that the findings be made public. During the discourse, the commissioners were reminded of their powers bounded by the Constitution to conduct investigations on their own accord. The body was also requested to examine the studies done by the previous ERC in the public service, contracts and procurement, and the allocation of house lots. And that has ended our recap of the major stories for the past week. We will be back here on Monday evening with MTV's News Update. I'm Sandy Ramutar. Bye for now.